fellow Rwandans, ladies and gentlemen, friends of Rwanda, I first send my warm greetings to you all. I wish you peace, development, and good health. Today, as we go through the 100 days of the 26th commemoration of the Tutsi genocide, I wish to share the true history that led us to the Rwandan genocide of the Tutsi people and other killings that are associated. <coughs> the remembrance of those who died in the genocide has come in an unusual circumstances when the whole world is faced by the COVID, rather COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, people cannot come together to support one another, as would have been the case. However, in one way or the other, we have to remember our own. Therefore, I wish to share in a few words the true history that bred the genocide of the Tutsi people of Rwanda in 1994. By remembering and bearing in mind this bad history, will be a firm foundation for the people of Rwanda to sort out their differences and hence to forge towards a country that, defi that is defined by lasting reconciliation and the unity of the people. <clears throat> As we mourn for the victims of 1994 the genocide committed by Rwandans against their fellow innocent citizens, I find it wise to desist from falsehood and lies and the truth about what exactly happened in Rwanda decades before, during the time of genocide, and the days that followed needs to be told with more emphasis on the genocide. The hatred that led to the carnage in Rwanda 26 years ago today still seems as fresh as ever, regardless the political rhetoric to distort the truth by the government. The hate that was mostly based on the ignorance by the Rwandan population starting from the top Rwanda's successive leaders since colonialism. I am stating this seriously. I am not making an overstatement. What one begs the Rwanda people to do is simply to accept our history. Until this time comes, the Rwandan people will find room into their hearts to forgive one another and forge towards reconciliation, unity, and development. What was the origin of all these conflicts? As we know, or as history has it, before colonizers came into Rwanda, all was fine. And the, the difference between the peoples at first was simply an economic one, where Hutu people mainly did their uh, crop farming and the Tutsi tending to their livestock. Gradually, these two classes came to be seen as ethnic divides. 
cattle or cows were considered more valuable than crops. Hence, this placed the Tutsi cattle owners at the level of the local elites. <clears throat> By the time the German colonizers first came in in 1884, already the Tutsi elite had been the luring monarchy for centuries. And later, the Belgians also came in in 1917. Both the Germans and the Belgians turned the Tutsis into symbols of, of the colonial rule for the Hutu who were the majority. This fake favor by the colonizers to the Tutsi people was their usual divide and conquer tactic which they later used to steer resentment and violence by the Hutu majority population. Because the Belgians still needed enough time for exploitation, when King Rudahigwa Mutara III started the process of demanding Rwanda's independence in the late 50s. They assassinated him and they later used their, divided, their divisive tactics to incite division by supporting or by switching their support to the Hutu against Tutsi in the name of emancipation and democracy. The Hutu elite, who were mostly from the seminary background, with enormous support and guidance from their local, I mean their colonial masters and the Catholic church leaders, planned and executed the first attempt to wipe out the uh, from the country, all the Tutsis in 1959. And the days that followed. At this time, in 59 to early 60s, tens of thousands were killed, maimed, raped, got their property confiscated. The rest were forced to leave their homeland and left everything behind. Many Tutsi women were held in bondage as sex slaves and laborers. It was a human disaster. And all this was happening on the watch of the international community. The League of Nations, which was the predecessor of the United Nations Organization, never said a thing to blame this evil that was going on when the Tutsi was being killed, were rather being killed and persecuted. <clears throat> um, I very well know that the genocide was planned by first the local leadership inciting hatred based on ethnicity to the Hutu population. Tutsi people were persecuted and expelled from their own country starting with 1959 and early 60s. The Hutu being aided by their former colonial masters and other foreigners who had interest in the country had the intentions to wipe out the Tutsi people in accordance to the teachings that the Tutsi were non-indigenous people of Rwanda, but conquerors who came all the way from Ethiopia, occupied and dominated the land. 
Therefore, no doubt, the Hutu people and their masters believed it was right to pursue, I mean, to persecute and expel these unwanted people, after all, who did not belong to Rwanda. Later on, after staying in exile for so long, the Tutsi people made efforts in the successive attacks from neighboring countries of mainly Uganda and Burundi to try to return their people back home, beginning from 1963 to 1967. They were fighting to come back home, but without success. And in 1973, after there was a change of power to another Hutu president, a few Tutsis who had remained in Rwanda were again persecuted, and there was another killing of the Tutsi. This caused more thousands to flee the country again for the second time. Efforts by the accumulated numbers of Tutsi refugees who were outside to negotiate their way back home were futile. Regardless efforts made by the regional host governments and some international partners to help resolve the Tutsi refugee problem, the Rwandan government under Habyarimana, backed by his Western friends, kept, I mean, kept ignoring this issue. <clears throat> At long last, as a last resort, after some years, in 1990, the children of the Tutsi exiles launched an armed struggle to end this refugee problem. The Hutu who never wanted the Tutsi back into the country had to resist this comeback very hard. And this, uh, this one took another level of animosity from the Hutu who had the state power into their hands. Hutu leadership started planning for the killing of the Tutsi as they had done before in 1959 and 1973 with impunity. They did all that with impunity. Nobody asked, nobody questioned. The Hutu-led MRND government made it a priority to focus on the war of denying the Tutsi entry into the country, vis-a-vis -vis to embark on the efforts to make people, I mean, peace through the peace process uh, that had been initiated. That was on the part of the Hutu, from Parme Hutu, and their successors in MRND leadership. Now, I jump over to the other party, the Tutsis or the RPF. Here is the untold truth about the role of the RPF in the Hutu killings during the war and into the genocide. Everyone is advised that it's now time that the victor's history must be retold. The sheer truth must be told because, as the English saying goes, the naked truth is always better than the best dressed lie. The RPF leader, Paul Kagame, planned and executed the Hutu peasantry killings from the northern border neighborhoods since 1991. 
These secret killings were headed by Nyamwasa Kayomba with his notorious DMI or Directorate of Military Intelligence, of which he led from 1990 to 1997. The Kagame leadership of the RPF killed the border Hutus mainly because they refused to listen to RPF's uh, political ideology and became totally unsupportive and uh, uncooperative uh, to the RPF's objectives. The Hutu peasants continued to make alarms whenever RPA soldiers passed in their neighborhoods towards attacking the FAR or the Forest Army Rwandais positions. They worked hand in hand with the FAR in the cordoning and searching areas during the hunt of the RPF soldiers in their areas. Also, the Hutu peasantry were resisting the RPA based on the MRND and their predecessor Parme Hutu hate policy towards the Tutsi that they had been thoroughly taught over decades. Kagame passed directives to Nyamwasa to kill and menace the Hutu along the northern border areas so that they can move to pave way for RPA attacks on the force Armel Rwandais. From late 1991, Poro Kagame and Nyamwasa Kayomba recruited a special commando group, mostly composed of young men who had come to join RPA from Kigali and other major towns from all over Rwanda. The killer commandos, or RPA technicians, as they were called, were easily penetrated in RPF cells without, I mean, throughout the country. The commandos under direct orders of Nyamwasa's Directorate of Military Intelligence, or DMI, were directed to kill MRND opposition leaders, do other random killings, and then to blame it on the government, which was also already targeting some moderate opposition leaders, and the Tutsis. <clears throat> when the news of the killings from the Rwandan and the Ugandan border reached the interior of the country, the MRND leadership used it as an excuse to continue to incite more anger and continued to use the killings as a resource to perpetrate and achieve their genocidal objective. From earlier starting with October 1990 invasion, the government made massive arrests of those Tutsis they called RPF accomplices, and the one the prisons were filled with Tutsis. In 1992, the Rwandan government started the killings of Tutsi in the area, these following areas, Bujesera, Chigari, Chibuye, Chibirira, Inijisenyi, and many other places that had the concentration of the Tutsi. In their public speeches, the MRND and other Hutu power leaders continued to incite the Hutu masses towards preparation of the Tutsi extermination. In most cases, the Hutu population were directly involved with FAR in fighting the RPA soldiers carrying with them whatever kind of weapons they could, they cordoned and hunted for the remnants of the RPA soldiers in the late days 
of the first phase of the war of October through December 1990. <clears throat> in the second phase of the war, in around May and June of 1991, uh, the FAR involved the Hutu population again. This time they got involved in cutting banana plantations and clearing the area of any plant or vegetation to deny cover to RPA soldiers in the Imutara area. Since fire was not strong enough to contain RPA, the DMI groups always sneaked into the population, killed a number of them, and caused them to free their homes. With the growing insecurity, Kigali government of Habyarimana, instead of working on the solution to stop the war, which was to recognize the children of Rwanda who were fighting to come back home, this having been the very cause of the problems, but the MRND government concentrated their efforts on perpetrating ethnic hatred they intensified their sensitization programs on the head for the Tutsi people. Every Tutsi was targeted and either dubbed an enemy or an enemy sympathizer. <coughs> Tens of thousands of the youth from the displaced population camps of these Hutus who were free, freeing from the fighting were joined to the notorious Inherahamu MRND youth wing and other Hutu youth wing groups. And all were prepared for the cleansing of the Tutsi. If Rwanda Patriotic Army would attempt to advance towards taking over the city of Kigali, the cleansing program for the Tutsi was disseminated to every Hutu peasant from all over the country through local leadership from the, uh, from, uh, the grassroots levels and the plan was mastered by all in that when the D-Day came, nobody was to hesitate on what was their mission. The families of the Tutsi people from Every town, village, hill, and workplaces were marked way earlier in the process of genocide preparation. By 1993, tens of thousands of Hutu youth groups had been militarily trained, and in Terahamwe in particular, had a military like structure from top down with a clear leadership and areas of assignment in which to operate when the genocide was to begin. <clears throat> there was good flow of information and networking with Inherahamwe leadership and the rest of the state's security apparatus. There was free flow of information between the army, fire, uh, Gendarmerie Nationale and the National Intelligence Agencies of Rwasir and Sirote, all the way to the top MRND leadership. That's how vividly the act of genocide was prepared way ahead of time. It was well coordinated and perpetrated towards its thorough execution. Therefore, there should no, be no doubt that the Rwandan genocide for the Tutsi people had more than enough time of preparation. On the other side of RPA, Kagame and Nyamwasa Kayomba did not make a big difference with those who were planning the genocide 
because they trained a special group of soldiers known as technicians or RPA commandos, as I earlier said, and distribute, distributed them all over the country of Rwanda to perform sabotage activities to kill the opposition politicians and innocent civilians and then blame it on the MRND government. Opposition Hutu leaders were being killed by RPA because of the following reasons. One, it was to create chaos and confusion among the Hutu themselves because there was already a Nduga Kiga divide and these killings would be definitely associated with the MRND ruling party killing its opposition leaders from the other parties. Two, Kagame did not want any Hutu in his government. He wanted to minimize the number of the Hutu participation as much as possible. He didn't want them as part of the RPF system after the MRND government was to be overthrown. Um, when Kagame and his henchmen, including Nyamwasa Kayomba, Kabarebe, and others, decided to bring down the plane that was carrying the president, Juvenal Habyarimana of Rwanda, and Cyprian Habyamira of Burundi, on the April 6th of 1994, this shooting triggered off the genocide that had been already in the pipeline and within the mindset of all Rwandan Hutu population, as had been sensitized. Therefore, on the next day, the 7th of April 1994, the genocide officially started all over Rwanda, as had been prepared. The Tutsi people were killed by their fellow Rwandan from the Hutu ethnic group, like there has never been a God into this country. The worst human catastrophe of the 20th century broke out, and the killing spree had to go on for nearly the next four months uninterrupted, and that was the Rwandan genocide for the Tutsi. During the genocide, the Tutsi had nowhere to turn to. They went for God in two churches, only to find these churches had been turned into throttling houses by their killers. From the swamps into the, in the, into the south, they were hunted by combined forces security forces, and inter army militias. They manned roadblocks to ensure not a single Tutsi was given a chance to survive. It was terrible. Wives gave away their husbands and their kids, in-laws, turned against their in-laws, uncles killed their own nieces and nephews, church members turned against their fellow church members from the Tutsi ethnic group, church leaders betrayed or killed or gave away their flocks, the military and other security uh, organs in collaboration with these Hutu Youth militias were busy devising how well the mission of extermination of innocent Tutsi people would succeed for a very long time. The Tutsi humanity in Rwanda was heading to extinction 
and they were surrounded and on target at every inch of the land. They had nowhere to turn to. The Lord God could not be reached anywhere near to save these souls that were nearing total extermination. As the fighting by RPA was in progress towards the capture of Kigali, immediately Nyamvumba and Dani Munyuza with their team as they were springing from the northern border in Kalama, Mvumba area, they started killing the Hutus from Zone Tampo or former demilitarized zone in areas of Rokomo, Mimori, Ngarama, Jituza, and later Nyamvumba, Patrick, who is today a general, continued to kill Hutus in Mulambi, then continued to Rokara, where he operated well, being deputized by Kazura, um, Kazura Jean Bosco, also along the Guamagana Chigari Road, killings supervised by James Kabarebe and Silasi Oda Hemoka from the Kagame Protection, these killings were going on in areas around Rwamagana Chigari Road, starting with Rwamagana area, Musha, Rujende, uh, and Moyombo, and then Kaboga itself. Mass graves were dug and the victims were thrown in and buried along this road from Guamagana to Chigari. On the eastern axis of Andavans and Afraid Ibinjira, a lot of people were killed and buried into massive graves, including big numbers of those that were killed and thrown into River Kajera. Also after the takeover of Chigari, and probably in a brief period of a year and a half after, Kagame and Nyamwasa's DMI network, in a collaboration again with a few of their special officers from the clique, like Nziza, KK, and many others, started a new wave of killings. The killings that in most cases took the lives of even the Tutsi genocide survivors because when they were gathering them from their home areas, they deceived them that they were being recruited into the military. And at times they were told they were moving them for safety because the war was still in progress in the south and the western part of the country. Therefore, they did not know who was a Tutsi and who was not. All they needed is to kill big numbers. Hence, the act was done by ferrying the youth from all prefectures of the country, starting with the western prefectures of Ruhengeri, Giseni, and Kiwi as a priority, and then swept southwards to Changugu, Jikongoro, and Butari. As these acts were going on, concomitantly, Killings were going on in around Gabiro Garrison areas in Akajira National Park.
there was already a big force on the ground in areas of Biomba and Kibongo prefectures under the command of today's General Patrick Nyamvomba, who was deputized by General today's General Jabosko Kazura. As part, um, uh, sorry, apart from the original killing sites around Campo Gabiro, at the presidential road, also the building referred to as Habiarimana's house, a building, a building that I can compare to the Jewish Auschwitz of the 1940s in Poland. And in the so-called new camp, a camp that was formerly for the Akajira National Park game rangers. Those two sites were used longer than the rest of other killing sites in the Akajira National Park. Also, other sites were scattered in the Akajira National Park distributed to each of the park lakes, namely Lake Nasho, Lake Hema, Lake Gwanyachizinga, Lake Hago, and other surrounding swampy areas. The killing of Hutu use by RPF under Kagame continued uninterruptedly from April of 1994 all the way to 1995 December and there were many other killings spontaneous one that were done in the years after this time we are trying to limit it closer within a hundred days and a little closer after the hundred days from April to July of 1994 That doesn't mean that killings went on for other years that followed. That should be noted. Other sites used to kill Hutu people during that very period between April 1994 and December 1995 were established by General Patrick Nyamvu, but when he was appointed a commanding officer for RPF's 1st Battalion, based in Jikongoro, and his forces deployed to control Nyungu Forest. He established killing sites in the Nyungu Forest, and he was using his soldiers to do the work. Later, the number of sites in Nyungwe were expanded by today's General Emmanuel Gasana, alias Rurai, when he was the IO of 301 Brigade. He added two more sites. Also, in 1994, General Aroizi Muganga, who was the commandant of Gashora Training Wing, established the killing sites of the Hutus in Izari Karama, which was an agricultural research center. And Kamabuye in areas of Bugesira. All of these Hutu killings were committed by the leadership and under the orders and directives or of the Lura of Rwanda today, President Paul Kagame. Those Hutu killings were well known by Rwandans of all walks. There is no way these killings by RPF under Kagame can be hidden. They are on record. In this period, when we mourn for our lost ones in the genocide of the Tutsi, all Rwandans, Hutus, Tutsis, and twas alike should focus on these historical facts of the killings based on ethnic differences 
and forge towards reconciliation and total unity. At this time and era, the solution to the Rwandan problem is to tell the truth about what exactly happened in our country during those killings, more especially who killed who, when, and maybe where. I, I know that it is hard and will not be easy for those under current Kagame's leadership to accept their role into these killings of the Hutu. I know the leaders who had an upper hand into these killings will always fight hard to cover up this information and try very hard to eliminate or mudsling all those who have the knowledge about these crimes which they think this in the turn will keep the Rwandan population and the international community in darkness about what happened. But we are now not letting that one happen. That's why we speak out. That's why we make this advocacy. It's therefore now too late. The information regarding the Hutu killings in our in uh, I mean in Rwanda during those days by the RPF is out and is in abundance. Many of Poro Kagame's high-ranking military officers had an upper hand in the Rwandan Hutu killings, and hence a big number of Hutu population lost their lives to the extent that the killings are no longer a secret. And with time, it became to be known publicly, despite much effort by Kagame's government to cover up this worst human rights violations. Therefore, the medicine to the Rwandan problems is sour, as it sounds, but it has to be tolerated and be administered. If Rwanda is to recover from its bad history, the medicine is the truth and reconciliation. Lies should be avoided and buried to the graves that they deserve and pave way for peace based on nothing but the pure truth. Both Hutu and Tutsi should accept their role in the Rwanda's past. They should ask each other for forgiveness. This is the right time to put our dark history straight. By doing that, Rwanda will be will enjoy lasting reconciliation, peace and total unity. <clears throat> All those who died were Rwandans. Death attested the same, whether to Hutus or Tutsis or Twas. This is death. Hence, it's so sad that the Hutu can't remember their people and mourn for their loved ones for the last 26 years. As we remember those who perished in the middle of the Rwandan genocide, Tutsi killed by Hutu, moderate Hutu killed by the fellow Hutu hardliners, Hutu killed by RPF commandos, or otherwise, and these Hutu mass systematic killings either within a hundred days 
all the days that followed. All these were death. It was, it was when one is dying. Therefore, the government of Rwanda should let the Hutu people also remember and mourn for their lost loved ones. This will be a very big step towards unity and reconciliation that we all crave for. I, the author, or the writer, was harassed and persecuted. I fled my dear country that I so much loved for speaking out. I fled because my life was in danger because of speaking the truth about those killings and other gross human, human rights violations and more. Until outside here, where I am, where I live, I have been threatened. And at one time in 19, uh, 2019, in December, Kagame's operatives here in the United States attempted to attack me for having shared my experiences, uh, more especially about Kagame's role in the killing of the late uh, Major General Jisar Gwejema. Also, my elderly parents were punished after I was able to escape these days uh, by the RPA DMI killers. My parents lived a degrading, the worst degrading lives at the hands of the Kagame killers. My parents died in misery and isolation because of this that I'm doing today, that I had done before. My parents were on Kagame's DMI watch all the times ever since I left that country of Rwanda. At their respective burial times, the DMI operatives were pleasant to watch and count who was there, who said what. This is the oppressive regime we have in Rwanda under Kagame. And this is what he harbors. This is how much he has contributed to the, citizens, to, to the citizens of Rwanda, immeasurably in all aspects, by killing, by, by these sufferings, by separating the parents with their children, separating families, pitting families, family members against family members, pitting Tutsis against Tutsis, and a lot of killings. And this is the person that international community now through crooked ways hail as a good leader in Rwanda. Therefore, unity and reconciliation are not possible with Poro Kagame and his group of killers still in control of that country of Rwanda. Because the current leadership had a big role in most of the killings, both before, during, and after the genocide. It's therefore clear that they have to cover up their crimes to elude justice at any cost. Whatever policy adopted by the current regime in Rwanda regarding genocide or the killings that took place in Rwanda in 1994 will be either for shielding RPF killers from facing justice or 
for the purpose of economic benefits to the Rwandan perpetual government under Kagame, but not designed for the peace and the reconciliation that the Rwandans need. In the regimes that preceded Kagame's RPF government, the leadership had taught to the population about hatred towards, I mean, based on uh, the ethnic differences. Today, the same teachings are made by RPF leadership. If you listened to public speeches by, for example, James Kabarebe and many other RPF leaders turned into Kagame puppets, those hate speeches by current RPF leaders makes no difference from those used by the MRND and other Hutu power leaders of the previous regimes in their public speeches to incite hate. Kagame himself had comments against the Hutu people on several occasions. An example is when the Hutu refugees were crossing into today's DRC, the former Zaire, in 1994. He made the worst comment, I mean, the, the worst hate comment, that he wished all those hundreds of thousands of Hutu would have been killed before they crossed to Zaire. The video and audio evidence to that fact is available on record. All these are evidences of how much hate Kagame has for the Hutu people. And those words spoken by a leader automatically represent his thoughts. In reality, after the 26 years after genocide, the level of peace and reconciliation among the Rwandan people haven't been made regardless the RPF government rhetoric leaned on soliciting praise from the international community. All Hutus in Rwanda today are treated as second-class citizens. They have no equal rights as their fellow Tutsi countrymen. No equal rights to government jobs, promotion or courses in both the police and the military rights to academic institutions, to do business with the government, and so on. There is obvious inequality in every aspect of life. It's common knowledge that the majority of Hutus are called the Interahamwe, even if they, bo they were born after the genocide of 1994, so long as they were born Hutus. Hutus in Rwanda, of today have replaced the Tutsis from 1959 to 1994. They live in guilt and fear of the crimes that they never committed. The new Hutu generation is required by the current leadership to apologize for the wrongs of their Hutu relatives. They live similar lives to those of Tutsi survivor remnants of 1959 conflicts who lived to, to pay reparations of the alleged crimes committed by the Tutsi monarch and their chiefs in the earlier centuries. They had to pay what was known as umusanjiro, a cow had to be throttled, eaten, and enough local beers uh, to feed the villagers had to be prepared or bought. This was to enable them to be accepted and live within the Hutu society. As thus, to quell down their anger and the hate that they had towards the Tutsi people in general. These Tutsi remnants who had remained in Rwanda 
pretty much lived on their oppressor's mercy. They could kill them anytime. Likewise, the Hutus to be accepted in the current RPF regime, they have to be either traitors against their fellow Hutus, they have to bear some exceptional qualities that serves the interests of the clique in the leadership today. And at most, they have to be puppets to this small clique of leadership. Any Hutu assigned to a government office has no substantial powers, but powers lies with the assistants because Hutus are not trusted by the current regime. They have no say to make any decisions and are looked upon, sorry, are looked down upon by their Tutsi subordinates. Today, after 26 years, after this genocide happened, if you, you are a Rwandan Hutu who live outside and you met any foreigner, if you say you are a Rwandan, they will not accept you for a Rwandan because of the RPF propaganda that they find around on the media which portrays Rwandans of today as a different people from you. They hear about different developments than you understand it. And too much of honey-coated language about the good things that are happening in today's Rwanda. Also, <clears throat> the hate ideology by the majority Hutu population from outside Rwanda today has not changed from what it was before the genocide of 1994. If you, talk, if you talked or tried to understand them, it's evident that people from the Hutu ethnic group are harboring a terrible grudge for a revenge against RPF Tutsis who came into the country by force of arms and won the 1994 war. Sincerely, some Hutus still utter the same hate speeches against the Tutsi as if it was before the 1994 genocide. And also, the Hutus who are outside in exile embark on a change. They are working on a change or they are trying to work on a change that is based mainly on Hutu benefits than the benefits of the Rwandans in general. Some people won't see it but I have watched this keenly, and that's what is happening. I don't say all, but some, which is catastrophic too. The whole hate is still fresh as ever. I am writing this from a broad experience living and relating with them, I mean with the Hutu people in exile, for a long time now, nearly 20 years. Hence, I know what I'm talking about. It's so sad. I beg all Rwandan, I mean all peace-loving Rwandans who will read or listen to this piece and wish the genocide and all these other killings not to happen to Rwandans again I ask them to disassociate themselves from the hate ideology that has defined Rwanda up to this date. The current government is using the iron fist 
to shut down and kill whoever tries to point fingers in their role in the 1994 and other killings in Rwanda. The truth must be told. If there has to be peace and reconciliation of, of all Rwandans, I am impartial in my writing, <clears throat> only that as a revolutionary, somebody who fought for these freedoms we are talking about, somebody who put my life on line for a very long time, and as a human rights activist that I am today, I need to continue the career of my passion, pursuing a dream that I started at my young age, in my early 20s, to join hands with other peace-loving Rwandans to continue help bring about peace to Rwanda through my long time experience and advocacy. I don't get paid or rewarded for what I do, but it's my long time struggle to bring about the change that the Rwandan people need so bad. I call upon all Rwandans to desist from ethnic based differences, but to embark on cherishing being Rwandans and love one another as if they were brothers and sisters. As we remember the victims of 1994 genocide, I have a few recommendations to share as follows. One, I do suggest that the government of Rwanda, led by Paul Kagame today, should continue with the genocide memorial programs, but should do some key changes as follows. All human remains that has been displayed for more than a quarter century now in our memorial sites must be accorded due respect and a decent burial. Enough is enough. It's now on record and well known in the whole world that the genocide for the Tutsi in Rwanda happened. It's therefore inhuman and humiliating for those who lost their people, me inclusive, to have their remains rather to have the remains of our, our, our own people displayed for this very long time. It is also detrimental to forgiveness if we need true reconciliation to succeed. Point number two, I do suggest that demonstration drills about how genocide was committed should also be stopped because it revives the emotions of the genocide to the survivors and to the relatives of the victims. All that may cause adverse psychological effects to our society. Not only do those demonstrations affect the survivors, but also affect the Hutu population in that it makes Hutus feel guilty of the crime that was committed by their fellow Hutus. And all of these are vices to the reconciliation that we want to need. Point number three. The Kagame government at long last should let the Hutu publicly remember their people who lost their lives in the genocide and all these other killings by either 
Hutu hardliners against Hutu or by RPA soldiers and DMI commandos under the Kayumba Nyamasa and the rest. I know the current RPF leadership will avoid this, to recognize this noble and sincere idea because it will look like I am implicating them into their role in the killings, but there is no option. The fact that the Hutus were also killed in the genocide and days after is very obvious and can't be concealed. The government of Rwanda today have done all they could to fight this information to come out, but it's always hard to hide the truth. Uh, former Minister Seti Senda Shonga and the Kano Member of Parliament for RPF, uh, Lizinde Tewanest, spoke against these killings. But they were both persecuted and later followed and got assassinate, assassinated in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, in recent years, uh, Madame Victoire Ngabire, a politician, opposition politician, said about these Hutu killings and as they deserve uh, remembrance and to let their people mourn for their own loved ones, and she was framed and incarcerated. And she still bears this burden, which, is, which has always hampered her political career. Uh, also, the young gospel singer, Kizito Mihigo, mentioned about this, the remembering of this Hutu and other killings that are rarely mentioned of. He made it clear, he made it clear that uh, there are other killings apart from uh, those that made to Tutsis, even though this one does not put away, it does not erase or change the fact that the Tutsi genocide was carried on by the Hutu hardliners, as I clearly put it in my writing. But in his song, this young survivor singer, the song Ijisoba Norochurufu, he made it clear that there are other killings. But because of that, from that song, that single song, that song that is aimed to reconcile with the Rwandan people. He was framed, charged, got imprisoned, shortly relieved, fakely, and later re-arrested and was assassinated into a Chigali police cell. All these were killed or imprisoned because they talked about these killings that the RPF does not want to be had unknown, that has been concealed for a long time, but these killings are obvious. We should recognize them after this long, long time. At this 26th commemoration of the Rwandan genocide, we must remember all those Rwandans that lost their lives within the days of carnage, Hutus, Tutsis, and Twas alike. And this should be done not only because it is humane and appropriate, but to pave a true path for the peace and the reconciliation that Rwandans yearn for. I stand with all Rwandans in remembering our lost ones. Please continue to be strong within these unusual times of COVID-19 pandemic. Let's work and pray hard 
that the killings should never happen again and put everything under care of the Almighty in the prayers. I wish you all everlasting unity, reconciliation, and peace. Thank you all. God bless you.